Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guests today are Sharon and Mark Hegel. Sharon is an entrepreneur and astronaut. She founded Space Kids Global in 2015 with a mission to inspire STEAM plus education and bring the possibility of space to children. She shares her journey to space and inspires students through speaking engagements to schools, nonprofit youth organization, science centers, universities, and space organizations. To date, Sharon has reached over 96,500 students globally. And recently, Sharon went up to space along with her wonderful husband, Mark, on board Blue Origin New Shepherd. There's a little laugh over there. <laughs> Sharon, Mark, welcome to the future of space. Thank you. We're Thank so you happy so to be here. Sharon, Mark, before we get into all the stuff that you've been working in your recent flight, could you share with us three words that capture the essence of space for you? Well, I think it's different for each individual, but for myself, the three adjectives that I would use would, would be how quiet it was. It was very quiet, uh, inspirational, and emotional. Mark? What about you? And, and Daniel, that's interesting. I gave that some thought, and I came up with something that might be a little different. Past, present, and future. I love it. I always love the personality, how people's personality comes through through these three words. Some people make actually a sentence, the final frontier, uh, or a player word. And I love the past and the future and the present. Sharon, I want to zone in a little bit on that emotional. You chose a word emotional. Why was it emotional? You know, I had the opportunity to watch Richard Branson do his flight and stay with the family. And I remember everybody was so emotional and that surprised me. And I had kind of, I had forgotten about that until we actually launched. And once you get out there uh, and get into zero gravity, it's, it's just different. It's very emotional. I think that's one of the, the part of the story that we often forget because we live in the world of simulation where you, know, you can go to a, a space center and see a star show or people put their uh, virtual reality headset and they think that they can experience nature. But there's a physicality to life that cannot be replicated. And when we talk about going to space so that people can experience space and experience the overview effect like you said there's a physicality to that experience that cannot be replicated that when you go there you will really be transformed correct absolutely you know we're still processing this and people say well how was it it's hard to describe you know, you can describe uh, the physical aspects of the launch, and it, it's like a very exciting roller coaster ride. But when you try to describe the emotional effects of it, I don't think there's real words to describe it. One has to experience it on their own. And I think everybody experiences it a little differently based on who they are and what they are. Mm -hmm. What was for you the, I mean, obviously you have the physicality of the G-force and you going up. And I know that the loss of gravity, your body wants to go there because that's a physical experience. But you have to kind of force yourself to look through, you know, through the window to be reminded that this is something that is about this view. How did you, like, what was going through your mind from the rocket launch and having this G-force and then this release of gravity and then looking out the window? Well, I'll take that first. Well, we had a plan. Our crew had a plan. And we discussed it prior to the launch while we were training. And we decided that, yes, we wanted to do the crew photograph, but we wanted it to, to look like we were in zero gravity. So we waited until uh, everybody had their feet off the ground. Uh, I, and then we had, we each had our individual plan. So Mark and I wanted to go ahead and do this space kiss. And I had to float over to him. And then we, most everybody in the capsule wanted to just hang on to the window and look at the view. What was yours? 
we had uh, in advance of the flight had an opportunity to do the zero G flight a couple of times. So we've experienced zero gravity prior to this flight. It's not the same because we're in zero gravity much longer here. However, uh, very clearly, we wanted to look out the window and and appreciate the new the new images, the new learning experience, and the emotion associated with deep space. And it was particularly interesting for me because my description is the black wall. I mean, it is solid black, very opaque, no reflection, no stars. That was just incredible. Uh, I came away with a little different impression. Um, you know, your the overview effect. We're looking down on Earth, and I walked away putting a new title on Earth. Earth is a satellite in space, no different than many other satellites. And why should why should Earthlings, why should humans not build other satellites and expand their capability and expand the technology and learn from that rather than just live off this satellite that we presently live on and use up all of its resources? Now, Mark, this is like this is a really um point that, I, that I've tried to communicate in the future space is what is the, the deeper story? And you, you kind of alluded to that and where, why should we limit ourselves or why would life limit itself? Because it's not just about us, it's we're the ambassador for life. So can you explain a little bit more for you and, and Sharon also, what is the life or the human story of going to space? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it kind of comes in where I started with the three words of past, present, and future. Past, Earth was formed, Earth grew. Humans uh, were able to uh, multiply and, and grow on Earth and take advantage of what Earth had to offer. But guess what? The population is starting to exceed the capacity of the planet. And unless technology starts developing new approaches, different approaches, and solves the problems that we have on Earth, not just global warming, but overpopulation, food supply, lack of water capabilities, numerous things, numerous things. Uh, technology and advancement and building off-planet places to live and understanding off-planet capabilities. Look at how much can be learned from that that can be of benefit to the human race and help solve our problems on this satellite. Sharon, do you have anything to add on, on, on this? No, I think Mark says it beautifully, you know, it, and also about the inventions that, that are possible as we explore other frontiers. I mean, you have, you have children, and I don't know if your children have grandchildren, but if your children lived in, under the same roof with the grandchildren and the great, great, great children, I mean, at one point, wherever you are, it becomes too crowded and the resources are being stressed and there's too many dynamics and there's a lot of conflict. So people start to leave the nest or the house and it's not leaving it with the intent of leaving everything behind, but it's more kind of spreading out the, 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 the input of information at the benefit of everyone. I mean, this is, this is what we've been doing ever since the beginning of time. We've been spreading to new places because that's how nature works. And it's not just about us. It's every organism, every mammal, every, every species does the same thing. It's just that now we're at the planet level and life went from single cells to multi cells. And now we're about to go from single planet to multi-planetary. Um, are you excited about what the future? I mean, you know, Mark, you were saying about the future. Are you excited about the future of, uh, of our species? Oh, absolutely. You know, um, just look at the, uh, the rate of human knowledge and how it's growing and the capabilities associated with that. Relate that to computer technology and singularity where someday computers might have more capability than the human mind. What happens when we start crossing over those lines and we start learning things and developing things and looking at opportunities that are imagine not imaginable today? What happens when we have the technology to do teletransportation? What happens when we have the technology to do time travel? There is nothing that stops us from doing that. And physics, if you study it, certainly indicates that those things are possible. 
So the human race in the present is at the infancy of learning what to do and how to do and how to develop the opportunities that that space might have for it and what other planets might have for the benefit of the Earth. Uh, what happens in the future as this starts growing? Uh, it's going to be expensive to get there, but if you look at the return on investment, traveling to the moon the first time was very expensive, but the return on investment was six times the cost of, of what it cost to go to the moon. What happens with today's technology and what we're going to be able to do for the human race in the future? It's incalculable. Well, and, and I think space is a game changer. If you just take a suborbited flight, just think what that possibility is in the future. You could launch in Orlando and be in London in 45 minutes. The, you have, I mean, you went up on Blue Origin. I think that you also have a reservation on um, Virgin Galactic. Um, yes. Obviously, you want to go, you've been, I mean, you've used... The, the place where you are in life to go to space. But I'm pretty sure that when you started your business and your career and your relationship, you didn't think that this would be possible. So <laughs> was space always, I mean, was it something that united the both of you? Is it something that grew as you get together, you got together and you saw the circumstances evolving? How, how did these points got connected along the way? You know, um, Sharon always says that I drag her along with the experiences, <laughs> but another way to look at it, Sharon taught me that uh, you have to be an opportunist of a certain extent. And the way she explains it, if you sit down next to somebody and you start talking to them, you never know what's going to come out of that conversation. And that's how this thing developed. Um, for one of our wedding anniversaries, our 11th anniversary, Sharon decided that we were going to fly on a zero gravity flight. Well, guess what? The head marketing team for Virgin Galactic was on that same flight. Fifteen years ago, it started our journey purely by accident and purely by taking advantage of the opportunities that were presented to us and by us participating in those opportunities. Well, and Mark started early on because he, he was, what, eight during? Why don't you tell them? Um, I first became interested in space uh, when I started watching the initial rocket launches out of, at that time, Cape Canaveral. Uh, of course, they changed the name to Cape Kennedy. Um, I remember being out on a lake with my next door neighbor on a raft that we built and watching the original Vanguard rockets go about uh, 10,000 feet up into space and blowing up because they never made it. And uh, from there, I've watched the entire generation of the space program as it's developed. I've, I've been very fortunate to live in Orlando most of my life. and. Uh, and I've been exposed to the space industry through all of that. Yeah, my story is a little different. Um, I remember I was in the sixth grade listening to a PA system when Alan Shepard became the first American in space in 1961. And, you know, as a child, you think, well, this is great. It's never been done before. But what does it have to do with me? Um, because West Virginia is a long way away from Kennedy Space Center. And I tell the kids when I go in to do presentations, just because you don't think something might happen today, be open to the possibilities for tomorrow. So Sharon, how did you go from looking at the Shepherd, Alan Shepherd, and then creating the Space Kids in 2015 and really focusing on STEAM education um, and doing the work that you do right now, just influencing an entire generation of young individuals that now um, have a connection to space that maybe they didn't have uh, had not been for you. Uh, let me go back to talking about the early days because how that all fits together is how exciting it was for us to have listened to Alan Shepard become the first American in space but also to be able to ride on the vehicle that was named after him. I started Space Kids Global seven years ago when nobody was really focusing on elementary school kids. I remember listening to a lecture here at Rollins College with Dr. Michio Kaku, who said, if you don't have kids hooked in math and science by six and seven, you've lost them. You take that with the 3.5 million job vacancies in the steam field that's predicted in 2025, and we've got a real issue. We've got to get these kids 
hooked on math and science and make learning fun through our hands-on projects. And what has been the, the most um, enriching discovery of that journey of, of Space Kids? The most interesting things that we've learned from the feedback from the kids is how many of them thought that an astronaut was the only job in the space industry. I think it's very important that the children know that there's a whole village, a whole team behind every launch, and that space is for everyone, that we're going to need chefs and doctors and des clothing designers. Um, that's why we want to make space for everyone. That's why we're bringing the possibility of space to kids. Absolutely. I mean, talking about space is not really just it's not just the destination is the future. We go back again to what Mark said earlier. It's talking about the future of humankind within the context of outer space, but everything that is our lives today with health, wellness, hospitality, apparel, everything, all these little things that we take for granted now have to be considered into this new frontier. And that's going to be an entire new economy where people need to develop the skills. So the kids have a kind of a now a blank canvas of, of what can be offered to them, right? Yes. And that's why we're reaching out to corporations that have like-minded businesses and opportunities that we can bring these hands-on projects to the kids. Um, for example, last year, we sent 21 science projects to the International Space Station on a SpaceX rocket right here in Kennedy Space Center. And then we just finished our national essay competition where kids between eight and 12 years old could write an essay on why I want to go to space. And with our partnership with Zero G, they have given them two seats to fly like an astronaut. Uh, we have one more program coming up this fall, uh, named that satellite. But we need more things like this so that kids have hands-on projects, that they become participators, not spectators and we can make learning fun. We're starting negotiations right now to uh, generate what I'll call summer camps where kids can go to the training centers like we did with Blue Origin and experience the training that we had to expose them to what space is all about, what it takes to get to space and to see what it takes to put a spaceship into space. Uh, we're also trying to generate relationships as Sharon said with corporations where we can set up internships so not just for the elementary school kids, but as they develop through, let's keep them involved and let's not let them forget what their possibilities are. And let's keep them keyword participating. We've got to keep them participating in the program. And if we can get internships with corporations, that does two things. It, it encourages the children to stay in the STEM fields. It also offers opportunity for the corporations to generate future employment. I totally agree with you, Mark. Um, and Sharon on the participation. I, I've worked with children before and the education is extremely important, but even more so it has to be paired with opportunities because education without this extension um, is just basically it's wasted knowledge. You know, for a lot of people, the problem is not to assimilate the knowledge, but it's to do something with it. And what I've realized when I talk to children is that there's the interests and the, 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 what they want to do when they're young. And what they end up to do is not always just a direct line. It ends up being, well, you know, there was someone at some time in my life that offered me this opportunity. It was not connected to what I wanted to do, but I needed to figure out. So what I always try to do is how can we remove the friction between their interest and the actualization of that interest and the opportunities. And that's exactly what you're doing by creating, obviously, the, the, the space camp, but connecting them after that, beyond that, into the corporate so, so that they can have less friction between what they want to do and where they're going, correct? Well, and expose them to the opportunities mm -hmm. and show them that there are opportunities and that if you have a good education, and a technical education, it can go in lots of different directions. It's amazing how people decide they want to major in a certain field when they go to college and how many people really end up following that exact dream. An opportunity presents itself, they take advantage of the opportunity and they go in a slightly different direction. 
And, uh, and we need to be cognizant of that, give them the basic education, give them the tools to work with, but then give them the opportunities so they can develop and use those, edu- those educational benefits. Now, it, Sharon, in your bio, it says STEAM+. Plus. I, I, I think a lot of people obviously know what STEM stands for. It's science, technology, engineering, and math. Recently, there's been a big push to include the A, which stands for art, but you also added plus. Can you, can you share with us the importance of the A for art, but also what, what do you see by adding the plus? Well, as I tell the children when we do our presentation, um, you know, we need the art just as much as the other letters. Can you imagine Star Wars without the theme song? Um, you know, art, we need the music. We need the painting, the painters. STEM uh, teaches you a <laughs> trade. STEM teaches you a field. STEM teaches you uh the, the basics of how to think and how to solve problems. A, arts, teaches you imagination and teaches you the possibilities. And if you put those two things together, you have a very well-rounded person. And usually, isn't music part of math? Absolutely. And then, of course, the plus at the end, that is? The environment. As we bring more children together, uh, you know, climate control, the oceans, the air, uh, I think that's an important part that needs to be added to the STEAM fields. I, I totally agree uh, with you, Sharon. There is a, I think, I also believe that that's one of the aspects that's been missing in their narrative of, of, our, of our humanity or our presence on Earth is there's a reciprocity with the world. We, we live, we're dynamic participant in this life on earth. And it's impossible to think that we can live without having an impact. We, we, we have an impact, but also we're meant to be an active role. We have to take from nature because obviously we have to survive, we have to eat, but we have to give back. And so this reciprocity is always really important. We are product of our environment. So if we want to trash our environment, ultimately it's against us. So this, respect to the world is not just to save the world, but it's also to save ourselves. And if we can bring this back into the story and make this relate the story of our, of our relationship with the planet, more about this relationship as opposed to us just having to save a planet. Cause a lot of people, they wake up in the morning and they're not intending to do wrong to the planet. It's just that the world is a lot more complicated, but if we can tie, their family, their future to the environment, then it becomes, I think, a a little easier. Uh, Would you agree? Absolutely. And I have to give credit to our friend, Richard Branson. He was the one that really brought that to the forefront. You know, the human race is a race of consumers, and I'm not saying that in a negative manner. It's just what it is. And if you look at the population growth and the consumption rates associated with that, Earth doesn't have a chance unless we figure out some solutions and figure out how to coexist and put it into balance. And putting it into balance means new technology, new inventions that don't exist today, a new way of providing a food source. There's lots of things that have to be developed and uh, a good STEM education develops the ability to start thinking about those things and come up with an imaginative solution. You know, the average age of the person that worked on the mission to the moon back in the 1960s was 26 years old. Young kids don't have boundaries. Their imaginations are unboundable and their ability to solve problems is incredible. And if you put that together with a good education and an understanding of how to approach a problem, what the human race can do is is not restricted in any, at any level. Well, and we see that every day in the private space companies as well. There's very few people over 30 because they bring new ideas. And this is, if if we become multi-planetary and we increase the population by X-fold, this pool of creativity, if it's nurtured correctly, becomes so bountiful. And I I mean, for me, just like looking into 
this future of new ideas that we didn't think would be possible and even having children coming to the table with their own perspective and growing up in the world of of li limitless opportunity i mean this is one of the reasons for me where why i want to take um with space 110 16 year old explorers on board space perspective so that they can experience looking at the planet when you're 16 at that at that age where you're developing that sense of awareness with the world can you imagine what it creates you know for their future so this this the importance of children into the world of future and increasing the knowledge just brings so much to look forward to as opposed to kind of pointing the finger backward and say how bad of a species we are it's moving forward with acquired wisdom um i think you would agree on that correct oh the the wisdom that will be generated in the future is is hard to understand today for example what happens if somebody invents a platform that we launch into space that collects solar energy of sorts i don't know what kind of energy it's something that we'll have to figure out in the future and beams that energy back to earth so we don't have to worry about the carbon pollution in the atmosphere what happens just that one simple little thing and how that changes the course of, of humanity on earth now you are the first couple who went up to space um I don't, I don't know the story at ISS, but maybe you're the first couple, the first two people to kiss in space. We don't know any of the backstories that happen on, on the International Space Station. Are you planning to be the first couple that goes a second time to, um, to space? Well, we are the first married couple to fly on a commercial space vehicle, that's for sure. And um, we had a lot of fun doing that. And what better way to experience space but to have your best friend and husband there with you. So we're imprinted for life and we'll always be able to talk about that time and space forever. Um, as far as the future, uh, as Sharon puts it, if there is a Santa Claus, we'll be able to fly uh, all of the major sources of space travel and continue to do it. What? Why is it so, why is it important for you to go and experience it again? Is it because you're looking to go deeper into the experience or um, what? what is your motivation? I mean, we could make a parallel with traveling, why going back to these places that we like, but for you in particular, the experience of going to space was so powerful that now you want to go back again, but are you looking to, to for something in particular? Um, like if you go back, I'm going to let you answer that, and then I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> uh, I get to go first. You know, uh, everybody we talk to that has gone to space, without exception, wants to go back. Um, it comes back to what we said at the beginning. It's such an emotional experience, and it's very hard to describe. And to not want to follow through on that experience and expand on it and expand your, your personal relationship associated with those emotions uh, um, would be a shame, and it'd be an understatement to not try to do that. Um, there is so much to be gained by uh, by expanding your horizon and then sharing that horizon with others and maybe helping them do things that they didn't know they had the ability to do. That's what Space Kids is all about. So there's a duality associated with it. Certainly the interest and the excitement of us going and what we're going to learn emotionally and secondarily, how it gives us credibility and gives us the ability to take that learning experience and share it with the young kids today and get them excited about it. Well, that was exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> I, want to, I want to experience <laughs> as much as I can that's different each time so that I can come back and share it with the kids and get them excited about their future. Because technology is changing so quickly, we don't want them to be left behind. It's, um, it reminds me of the day, the first time that I jumped out of a plane uh, for skydiving. You know, you spend the entire day in class looking at the protocol, what to do. But the minute that you step out of that plane and you're hanging on the, on the wing, you know, for dear life, and you let go, <laughs> 
all yeah. this goes out the window and the next thing you know the parachute is open you're a journalist like, <sighs> and obviously you can't really process you cannot really i mean you enjoy the moment but the adrenaline and the the emotion of the moment is so high that you want to go back up so that you can kind of be able to process with a little bit more control so that you can have your a balance between the brain and the, and the emotion so that it's not just overtaken by by the emotion so going back up obviously now you have a little bit more you, you know what to expect and your brain is trying to take a little bit of control so you can enjoy the moment how so is it confirmed that you I, I know that you have reservations for virgin galactic correct right yes we signed up with virgin galactic back in 2007 so to have this possibility last week to go to space was a 15 year dream come true um would you are you planning also to go to space perspective which is a, a total different experience actually uh yeah. we're already signed up with space perspective we're on flight number four flight number four, four seems to be a really good number for us yeah. We were on uh, Blue Origin number four, uh, manned, manned flight number four, and we'll be on Space Perspective number four. Oh, wow. So is it is it totally? Actually, that was. Crew, crew four. Yes. We were on the 20th mission, NS20, but we were on crew four. And with Space Perspective, we will be on crew four with them as well in 2024? Yes. Oh, wow. Another four. Is there um, is there a story behind the four, or is it just a coincidence? No, uh, it's hard to. You never know what numbers are going to do for you. Uh, in in my family, the number twenty six comes up over and over again, so I'm sure it's going to come up in space travel also. Well, twenty six, it's two plus six, that's eight, that's two times four. <laughs> we can. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Numerology, if we bring it down to numerology, uh, numerology, it's always interesting. Uh, my, um, I asked my wife the other day if um, when we're about 90 years old, you know, towards the, the, the last uh, stretch of our journey together, if, they, if there were, it would be a possibility to get a one-way ticket on a spaceship that goes into either Mars or uh, to beyond, uh, would she agree to, to take it? And she was like, yes, I would take it. Because of it, the idea of ending this journey on this planet by going to places that very few or just this embarking, visualizing this future, um, I think for me, that would be the best way. If the opportunity would present itself to take this one-way ticket together, would you two take it? I think there's too much to learn. I'm not interested in a one-way ticket. I, I'd be very interested in going to Mars, but then I'd want to go on to uh, other locations in addition. Um, I'm, I'm always looking for the next thing to learn. Well, and I always think with the way technology is advancing today that they're predicting what, the baby boomers are going to live to 120? I'm in. There's uh, Sharon. Sharon has a funny story. Uh, yeah, Blue Origin has a program where they're launching uh, postcards to space and young kids are writing postcards to themselves with a message on it and Blue Origin's flying it to space. Perfect. And then when it comes back, they uh, return it to the child stamp that it's been flown in space. So Sharon tells the story that 25 years later. Oh, we're, Space Kids Global is partnering with Club for the Future, um, which is Blue Origin's charity arm. So we had a little girl who was three years old that was drawing her postcard that's in the space. And I posted it on social media and I said something like, can you imagine when she's 25 years old and she's going through a drawer and she finds this postcard and she says to herself, I remember doing this. I was living on earth then. It could happen. I had this, um, I was talking to Janet Ivey who was a, a space educator and we were laughing a little bit about visualizing this uh, Coke commercial because Coke came up with the, the new um, flavor. It's called Starlight. It has a, a little bit of raspberry in it. Um, but we were imagining this commercial where a kid that lives on the moon 
communicates with a kid that's on the planet through this um, almost mo Morse code or light signal. And then they meet in between uh, the space station and the share code. But this is where we're going. This is where we're going to have these experiences where we, we didn't think would be possible. I mean, it just watching a a, a rocket landing upright i still my, my my eyes my brain is always having trouble really comprehending the, the, the what i'm seeing because it's so counterintuitive do you still get excited when you see um a, a rocket landing upright Ooh. oh <laughs> one of my favorite memories is when spacex had the dual boosters land side by side simultaneously that's incredible and that's a game changer for the space industry. It's like sci-fi movie. I know we were we were just over at the Axion launch at Kennedy Space Center on Friday, and I was surprised at the triggers that Mark and I were experiencing. Even when they were doing the countdown, you know, three, two, one, liftoff. I mean, it was so emotional. You were like right back in the capsule, filling the engines and the jarring. Uh, it, it was, Awesome. Now, when you float back on the, on after going to the star uh, to to space um, on board Blue Origin, New Shepard little capsule, there's this moment I always uh, wonder how it feels when you're about to touch. There's this jet of air. Uh, is it like you know a big break or there's it's a soft landing? How did it feel inside the um, the, the capsule at that moment? <laughs> We have two different opinions on that. <laughs> you know, uh, you see a big cloud of dust come up from underneath the capsule, but that's because it, files a it fires a thruster just before it hits Earth and softens the landing considerably. Uh, and then the seats that you're on are uh, an X format that have springs associated with them. So it's very, in my mind, it was hardly jarring at all. In Sharon's mind, well, I saw the earth coming up very quickly. And so I kind of locked myself into the seat a little more. And then when we hit, it was a little harder than what we had in the simulator. That's for sure. I find it always interesting. You know, when my wife and I were in the car, um, I'm usually the one driving and our perception of what happens around, around this drive is always extremely different. Just, uh, just on the on the on the personal level, who usually drives um, between the two of you? Uh, he won't let me drive because I'm won't let. I, I'm Andretti. Uh, he, he says I make him nervous, but I like to go fast. <laughs> I, I don't understand how this works. Sharon goes fast, and she's weaving in and out of cars, <laughs> and I get all the tickets. I don't understand. That's because you drive like a little old man. <laughs> I always, I used to be a, um, I used to be in my younger days, I was a, a, a guide for kayaking on expeditions. And every time that, that we got a couple and put them into a double kayak, uh, whatever dynamic was in between the couple really came up to the surface instantly. The, if they were a good communicator, uh, it showed. But if there was any cracks or bad communicator, it just turned out to be like a big mess. And it's the same thing in cars, how the communication and the perspective, my wife always thinks that I drive too fast. And then when she gets behind the wheel, I'm like, this is, you know, it's like I'm super nervous. Um, so it's always interesting. How long have you been together, by the way? Oh. We've been together 29 years and married this month, 26. So that was one heck of an um, anniversary gift. Yep. Congratulations. Do you want to share with us a little bit how you two met? And, and, by, the way, and by the way, there's that 26 again, isn't it? <laughs> how maybe, did we maybe meet? Maybe that's the end. How did we meet? We met on the internet. Oh. Where I was interviewing you. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, Mark and I are both in the real estate business, and I was doing site selection for national tenants in the Southeast. And one of my clients was Public Supermarket here locally. Well, no, I guess they're throughout the East Coast. Um, and we met 
uh, because we were trying to decide whether we were going to merge companies back then. Yeah, we were uh, we were developing uh, shopping centers throughout the southeast uh, with a competitor of Publix, and what we and we wanted to start dealing with Publix and taking them into the Mid Atlantic. At that time, they had gone up to uh, Georgia, Georgia, and they hadn't gone further north than that. And uh, we were looking for someone that had that attachment and that relationship with uh, Publix, and Sharon was that person. Well, I'm so glad that it's you. Oh. Yeah, but the rest of the story. Go ahead, Sharon. The, the, the rest of the marrying story. Our, marrying, her was much, marrying her was much more expensive than the merger. <laughs> now, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey says, uh, my good friend was VP of real estate and was my mentor. And so when I brought up Mark's name, he, he had the uh, legal team, legal department do a background check on him before I ever met him. <laughs> and he says, I think he's good. I think he's a keeper. <laughs> well, I'm glad, I'm glad you two met because it created such an inspiring journey, obviously with going to space and moving forward as we, because I want to be mindful of your time, moving forward, what is, what are you going to be doing with all this um the material and the experience that you two went through um what is next well there's a game plan being designed right now and sharon's been in a series of meetings since we got back as to just how we're going to take advantage of this opportunity in our five minutes of fame and convert that into uh, the charity and how we can use it in the charity to expand its capability and its reach and uh, that's in planning right now, and, uh, and it'll start unfolding in the next 30 days. It's given us terrific opportunity, and, uh, I, and we're going to take advantage of that as quickly as possible. And if people want to learn more, where do they want to work? No, that's the Sorry, come again? I was going to say that's the business answer. Now, Sharon will have the, uh, the child answer. No, I, I, you know, I, I just wanted to leave you with one thought, and that is when we do go into schools and the children run up and they say, are you an astronaut? Can I be one? And I think that's what we need to capture, the excitement, the curiosity, and the imagination. If people want to learn more about Space Kids and all that is coming up for you too, where can they go? Uh, visit our website, www.spacekids.global. Just be mindful that it's .global and not space, just dot, blah, blah, blah. be mindful that it's .global. That's the new .com. It is indeed. Well, Sharon, Mark, it was a pleasure having you on the Future Space, having this candid conversation about your experience, about space, about children, um, I'm looking forward. I mean, we still do these uh, interviews over Zoom. Uh, I think the, the mobility is, is open. The opportunities have opened up, but at the same time, mobility is still challenging. I'm looking forward for a path to cross um, so that we can continue this conversation maybe over a bottle of yeah. wine. It's always, yes. uh, it's always a wonderful setting to do so. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you, Daniel.